Are you saved? That's an important question. It's a phrase that maybe some of us are very familiar with. But think for just a moment how strange that may sound to some. Saved. What, what does that mean? When we think about the way we use the word saved just in day-to-day -day language, it does have a very different meaning oftentimes from the way that we would mean it when we talk spiritually. I felt like I was saved from an incident this morning. Uh, I was driving here to the building before daylight, and uh, just as I was right in front of the building, I saw the strangest thing. I saw one of those little brown paper bags standing up right in my lane. And you know, to see a bag standing straight up, that's not something you'd expect. And so just as I'm focusing in on it, thinking, how's that bag standing up in the lane? I realized the bag started moving standing straight up. And I thought, well, that's odd. And by this time, I'm right up on top of it almost. And last minute, just enough time to swerve way out of the way, I realized it was a white skunk with his tail straight up. Just hanging around one part of the road and then he'd move around to another part of the road. And I thought that's the way we need to greet all the Sunday morning crowd this morning with a fresh skunk smell all over the front area of the church lawn. You know, you could say because of my keen observation, I swerved just in time to save us from that. Maybe you've wanted to go on a trip and, and you say, you know, we're gonna save up for this trip. Or I think about Michelle Myers a few years at her workplace. A man fell in, in the floor with a heart attack. She grabbed a defibrillator and his heart wasn't beating. She shocked him. And the doctors say that she saved his life. We understand what it is for lifeguards to take a responsible position, to stand guard for their watch, to say, if someone is drowning, I will save them. But I'd like for you just a moment to pass through a few scriptures with me to see how the Lord speaks of salvation. And then we'll land in a beautiful passage in Hebrews in just a moment. In John the third chapter in verse 16, Jesus said to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus, you don't have to perish eternally. You can be saved because God loves you that much. God loves you so much, he wants you to be saved for eternal life. Back up to Mark the 16th chapter, what we oftentimes call his great commission, the record of the great commission. I'll read verse 15, you're familiar with that, but listen to verse 16, Mark 16 and 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so Jesus gives this great commission. He says, listen, if individuals won't believe and be baptized in me, they're going to be condemned. Jesus is saying, I don't want that. I want you as disciples of mine to go and I want you to tell every creature around the world that Jesus wants you to be saved. That literally is the message of the Great Commission. Jesus wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to be condemned. Drop back, if you will, to Acts the fourth chapter. I have a reason why I love Acts the fourth chapter beyond verse 12 because of the significance that it teaches. And my reason that I'm about to share with you isn't as important as the significance. But I've shared with you before that when we lived in Gadsden, Alabama, I was in my early 20s and one of my best friends was in his 70s. And that's kind of interesting because when you're in your early 20s, that guy might as well have been 110 years old. You know what I'm saying? And, and he oftentimes... He oftentimes would just work Acts 4.12 into his day-to-day -day conversation. He loved this verse. Think about what is said here about salvation. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must 
be saved. There's no one else. In just a minute, we're going to land in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, and we're going to ask the question, what's so great about salvation? And what's so great about salvation is our Savior. Listen, out of everybody that has lived and is living and will live, no one except one could save us. Under heaven, there's no other name that can save. Jesus is the only one that can save. Romans, the first chapter. In verse 16, it talks about the gospel. I want you to think about what is the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus, the only one that can save. The gospel is the good news about his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. Now, I want you to think about that as we read Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. What salvation? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. No other name. When we go out and we tell others that gospel story, we are telling them how to be saved. And now let's get a little closer to our text. Hebrews, the second chapter, still not the text, but I'd like for you to notice how the Hebrew writer says this in verse one. And think about what we've been studying this quarter in the importance of scripture. Is it final authority in our life? Do we believe that it's infallible? Do we believe that it's the word of God? Even if we say yes to that, look at verse one of Hebrews two. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. What if I'm saved and it becomes meaningless to me or I become distracted and I drift away from the very Savior who had saved me? Verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, I need to recognize there's punishment for leaving the Lord. Verse 3, this is going to be our word salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first begun to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. But look back at the beginning of three. How shall we escape? How shall we escape? If we're not saved, we're captured in sin, headed toward condemnation. I don't want to be there. How can I escape that? If I neglect, we're not adamantly opposed to it. We're not picketing that we're atheists. If I neglect, what happens when you don't go in and tend to your garden for just a few weeks? It looks like it's being neglected, right? We've all seen animals. It doesn't take long for an animal that doesn't have a caretaker that is caring for it to look like a neglected animal. How does your spiritual life look right now? Be honest. Does your spiritual life right now look neglected? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation. Now, what is great about that salvation? Listen, there are many things that are great about that salvation. It, it, we literally could talk the rest of our life. But I want you to think about one aspect that is so great about our salvation tonight and it's our savior our savior is the one who makes our salvation so great turn over to, to hebrews the seventh chapter hebrews the seventh chapter we're going to pick up in the middle of a thought but for time's sake we need to do that and so we're going to pick up in verse 18 and 19 and i, I want you to think about how up to this point he has talked about how Christ, this great Savior, is greater than the angels. He's greater than that great lawgiver Moses. Now, we're back from the beginning of Hebrews working through. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than that great lawgiver Moses. And he is greater than the greatest high priest that's ever been on this earth, including Aaron. 
What's so great about him? Let's read 18 and 19 of Hebrews 7. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. That's talking about the old law. The old law just could not make us complete. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And the following verses that we'll read in just a moment is going to tell us that that better hope is Jesus Christ. He's the greatest high priest that has ever been offered. Our salvation has a better hope because our high priest is Jesus. And our high priest can draw us closer to God. You know, the, the high priest could go into the holies of holies once a year and he would make atonement for the people. And that was an effort to draw the people as close as they could be drawn to God. Our high priest Jesus offers a better hope and he can draw us closer to God than any high priest could ever draw people to God. Let's look at that for just a moment, just out of the book of Hebrews. I want you to notice we're going to look at passages that speak about Jesus being that one, that high priest that can draw us close to God. Let's back up. Let's look at Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and I'd like for us to read 14, 15, and 16 and see what makes Christ such a great Savior as our high priest. Verse 14 of the fourth chapter of Hebrews, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. How did he pass through the heavens? He passed through the heavens the first time to descend and pass through the womb of Mary and come to earth in flesh. And he lived and he went through all the struggles and the trials and the temptations that any of us would go through. He was in all points tempted as we, the Hebrew writer said, yet without sin. He passed through the cross, death, the resurrection, and he passed through the heavens again as he was ascending. He descended through the heavens. He ascended through the heavens. Why all this passing through the heavens was for our benefit. Notice that. Seeing then, verse 14, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Are you going to waver on that? Do you believe in the one? Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. How close can you get? Come boldly to the throne of grace that he may obtain mercy and find grace grace to help in time of need. We can draw near and this high priest can bring us all the way to the throne of mercy and to the throne of grace. In the Old Testament times, the culture was you were not allowed to come before the one sitting on the throne unless you had been invited. And if you came without an invitation, it was worthy of the death penalty. Even under the old covenant, the mercy seat of God was behind the curtain. The high priest once a year was the only one that was allowed to come that close to the mercy seat of God. And now because of Jesus Christ, we are invited to come boldly and not only invited, the one who is inviting us says, I sympathize with you. Did you notice that in 15? I went through the temptations you go, have gone through. I sympathize. I know what you're dealing with. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we have a Savior who is so great, but yet He can understand what we have gone through. Flip over to the 10th chapter. Let's begin reading at 19. Let's think again about this priest. The 10th chapter in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holy, the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Remember when he died on the cross, the veil was rent. Now we can pass right in. How? 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How close can we get? The veil's been ripped back. Because of the blood of our high priest, 
we're all invited to come and not sit in the upper deck, not just be invited to the same city where he lives. We're invited to come and pass through the veil and stand in the presence of God. That's how great our Savior is. But I need to understand the way the book of Hebrews closes. Look at Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Let's read 12 and 13. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Did you get that last part? We go outside the camp to be with Jesus, bearing his reproach. They didn't crucify Jesus inside Jerusalem. Crucifixion was too nasty to do it downtown. Get away from civilization. Take him outside the camp. We don't need that kind of violence inside our city. Get him out there. Why is that guy hanging there? Oh, we want him to suffer. And Jesus says, I want to take you into the presence of God. And I want you to know that I sympathize with the things that you go through. But I want you to know this. If you're going to come to me so that I can bring you to the presence of God, you've got to leave the city and you have to meet me out of the camp and you have to be willing to suffer the same reproach that placed me outside the camp. The world didn't appreciate Jesus. And when you and I form our convictions based upon Jesus, the world will not always appreciate us either. And so the cost of discipleship is being willing to carry the reproach of Jesus. When it's time to suffer and sacrifice, are we going to instead give in and be conformed to the world? Or are we going to suffer that reproach and be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ? You see, the reason that all of that is worth it, go back, if you will, to our text in Hebrews 7. The reason it's worth it is because our Savior is not only so great as this high priest that can bring us near, but He's so great in the sense that He is complete. There is in no way that He lacks sufficiency and that He holds back anything that we would need to be saved. Now listen, for time's sake, I'm just going to go through here and point out something out of a few of the verses. I hope you have your Bible open. I want you to notice what we're going to work toward. I want to go, I want to go ahead and show you the end of verse 28 of Hebrews 7. Look at the end. The very end of verse 28. Appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. That's what we're working toward. Who is this one that is perfect and complete in every way? He's our Savior. When we say, are you saved? What does that mean? Have you come to the Savior? Well, who is He? Let's notice how complete He is. Look at verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. He is a guarantee. That's how complete He is. You don't have to say, well, I, I'm not for sure about this. Oh, no. And, and I, 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 I hesitate to use such a, a, a light expression, but, but we would say, you can take it to the bank. This is a guarantee. That's kind of some of the language that he's using here. He says, listen, he, it, he's our guarantee. He is complete. Look at verse 23. Also, there are many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Think about that there was a high priest back in the days of the children of Israel. And you'd come and you'd offer your sacrifice. You'd come back the next year, you'd offer your sacrifice. Hey, Mr. High Priest, you'd speak to the high priest. And one year you come back and say, Where, where's the old high priest? He died. What about this high priest? If he's so great, what are we going to do when we come to him and we learn, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, he passed away. The only one that can do all this. Oh, he, he's not here. 
He did die once, but death couldn't hold him. Look at the next verse, verse 24. That's why it closes by saying, has an unchangeable priesthood. Because in verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives. He can save to the uttermost which continent you live on. It doesn't matter which continent you live on. Are you willing to come to God through him? What about if you do it today? Is he going to be around later when it comes time for judgment? Absolutely. He lives forever. He is complete. He can save because he is alive. And that means something when you're talking about somebody that has already died. He is alive. He is resurrected. He has conquered death and he will live forever. And anybody else that wants to be saved. He can save them. We can't drift away from him and be wise. We can't neglect him and get to where we want and need to be. And so he talks about in the rest of 25, just beautiful characteristics. He makes intercession for us. He's the high priest who is holy, who is harmless, who is undefiled, separated from sinners, and higher than the heavens. Verse 27, who does not need daily those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints a high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. We could talk about many things about why our salvation is so great, but we would never find a reason greater than our Savior. He's complete. He's going to live forever. And He came to this earth to die for us because He loves us that much. Tonight, I realize that most of us here, we know that Savior. We love that Savior. We would lay down our life for that Savior. We serve Him every day. Sometimes it's good to pause and be reminded from Holy Scripture of how good He is and how great He is. But there might be someone here that they've neglected their Savior. And what a wonderful opportunity you have tonight to commit your life again to the one that you can't afford to neglect. Or maybe you've never laid your life down to that Savior. Maybe you've never been baptized into Him for the remission of your sins. What an opportunity tonight. What an opportunity to bring ourselves to the greatest one who has ever walked the face of this earth. You don't have to worry about Him not wanting you, not loving you, not caring. He loves you more than anyone has ever loved you. Tonight, we'll sing a song in just a moment. I plead with you and I beg you, do not neglect so great a salvation. If we can help you in any way, come as we stand, as we sing.